This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. very much for your explicit history lesson. Um, my observation is that you've described why there's Donald Trump being so popular. <laughs> I know and so. it's not a joke, sir. I know. No. Uh, in I fact, know. while the media has the focus on the Donald, the real problem is the people that go to his rallies. <laughs> and I think you've described to a T the reason they're going only they don't come to your lectures, they feel it in their souls and their bellies. My lecture is not a political lecture, but the law is political. I'm not really trying to suggest solutions to the terrible conditions that exist, but rather try to understand the changes in the law that caused them. But I agree with the comment that the gentleman made because uh, both political parties have failed an entire generation of Americans. That's what that 3.5% economic growth is about. And that's why people are, in addition to a lot of other stuff that's going on, I think it's a big problem. Well, I think this political science department and UCSD in general, from which I hold two degrees, might consider the fact that it was not raised that Mr. Lyric is a convicted felon. He served time in prison. And he was convicted all the way through. Now, that's beyond my estimation as to how. I'm not a lawyer. But one question, I'm sure, Mr. Lyric, you're aware that many industries look on you very unfavorably. The technology industry in particular looks on you as a legal extortionist who went to companies that, for one reason or another, and with no blame on their side, had bad quarters. You sued them. They settled on the basis that they had to pay something, and they were, didn't have the time or the legal expertise to do it. And the money ended up in the New York law firm. What do you have to say to those questions? Well, look, I think it's, uh, your first question is legitimate. Uh, I did go to jail. Uh, uh, we, uh, maybe I should take a minute and talk about what we did. Uh, there was a practice in the field of class action law many years ago, these are old, old, old events, of lawyers compensating the named plaintiff uh, by paying them a portion out of the legal fee if the case was successful, only if the case was successful. It was meant to compensate them for the agita and torture that they had undergone in trying to, to be a plaintiff. Um, it was going on when I came into the field. I learned about it, and I tolerated it. It was unethical. It shouldn't have been done. It was kept secret because if the corporations find out about it, they would have used it to defeat meritorious cases to help ordinary people. Unfortunately, it turned out that it was more than unethical. Uh, aggressive prosecutors uh, find a way to make it criminal. Uh, we had done what they said we did in that regard. I ultimately decided to plead guilty in return for a plea arrangement where my firm would be left alone and the investigation would be stopped. I think we were politically targeted, but that doesn't matter. It happens to everybody all the time. It's uh, the cost of uh, being uh, in that field. Uh, I took the punishment, served the time, paid my debt to society. Uh, didn't enjoy jail very much, wasn't a very pleasant experience, had a wonderful family waiting for me and was happy to come back to them. So the second part of your question, I obviously just disagree. I think if you look at the 
scope of the cases that a uh, great many of them accomplished a great deal of good for a great many people. I understand every man is innocent in his own eyes and no one likes to be sued and the high-tech executives didn't like us. I sort of take that as a, as a compliment. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that's where it is, you know. I, I appreciate your point of view. Thank you. If, you know, if people want to argue the other point of view, I suggest you get your slides and your facts and uh, you argue them. Thank you. Um, over here. Bill. Um, so my question is, I was particularly excited by that last slide, the one that showed the kind of start of an economic analysis that showed, um, that showed uh, in fact, sort of a concept of sort of corruption overhang on the economy. Yes. And I just wanted to, you know, to encourage you and perhaps some gr uh, ambitious grad students in the audience to work through some of that economic analysis because that's a very salient politically. It's very important because it counters the opposing argument, which is somehow, uh, you know, that this work is, is, is damaging to the economy and that arbitration is more efficient and all of those things. So somebody to flush out this work would be of, of great, great, great importance. Uh, it's a terrible chart, it done, but it's an important well, I'm point. I'm glad to see you being an amateur ec economist, because yeah, it's a right good start, <laughs> so good job with this, and it'd be great to flush it out. And, and that's nice, because it comes from a guy who's going to be the President of the United States, I suspect, someday. Jared Schutz, who's a congressman from Colorado, <laughs> and a great friend of ours. <laughs> I'd just like to say quickly, uh, I've known Bill most of my career. He was my mentor, but in response to the gentleman who spoke a moment ago, uh, Bill went to jail personally, served his time, unlike any of the bankers and other corporate officials that he spoke to. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderfully interesting and thoroughly depressing talk. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> one, one area that I don't think you did touch on uh, that I think is of equal significance is that of the environment degradation. I wonder if you would comment. Oh, God. I mean, you know, there's so many bad decisions, and you can't cover them all. You're absolutely right. Look, it's, it, it's an across-the-board restriction of citizen access to the courts. Citizen lawsuits are subject to abuse, like any lawsuits are subject to abuse. But they're not subject to the kind of corruption and lobbying and political stuff that goes on with government enforcement. And if you think about them, they're capitalism in action. These are cases brought by lawyers using their own money, investing their own time, trying to create a result, and only getting their money and a fee if they win and prevail. That's a pretty good market discipline against frivolous lawsuits, I'm telling you. So I believe in private enforcement, and I think it, it, it's, it's a shame that it's going away. Again, I'm sorry, I, I, it's not my job. You're, you're. <laughs> Bill, <clears throat> I want to express my gratitude again for however depressing your lecture was. <clears throat> Halfway through, I was thinking, wowzers, these uh, luxury prisons <clears throat> must be filled to capacity. Three quarters of the way through your lecture, I thought we should pull our money, perhaps buy these prisons and convert them to condos. <laughs> what my question is, to turn this massive tide of, 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 of legal consequences and turn it in the, in, in the back in the interest of the peoples, is that a political process? Do you see this as uh, it has to come from the grassroots and if so, are we calling it a political revolution? And if so, is there a candidate that you're favoring or one that you're super opposed no, no, to? No, it's, it's no. Look, it's not political. The Democratic Party is very guilty of many of the things I'm complaining about. In, in saying so, Your, uh, Your Honor, excuse me, Bill, I'm referring to an independent under the guise of a Democratic. <laughs> I, I, look, I, it took 25 years for them to do what they've done. You have to work within the system. We have to fight our way back. 
uh, it's po political fight. We, we have to, you know, make progress in legislatures and, and judiciaries. But there's a, there's a, a dean here, and, and, and actually a couple of people in law school. You know, I really want, what I want to see is young law students made angry. I want them to be critical. I don't want them to revere blindly the law. I want them to come out of law school armed to fight against this stuff. And we've got to find a way to do that. OK? Thank you. Uh, my question is, is framed by your remarks on social mobility. And I run Reality Changers, and we send hundreds of low-income inner-city kids to UCSD every summer, but thousands are left behind. Uh, so my question is, do low-income inner-city kids who aren't receiving the education that others are, would they make a great class for a class action huh. lawsuit? And They probably what, what signed is, an arbitration agreement. Uh, or what is their uh, recourse? No, uh, look, I, I'll uh, tell you something. And I, I, there are lawyers here who are wonderful class action lawyers. I, I, it breaks my heart to say it, but I, I think the back of big class actions, the big tough cases that recovered billions of dollars, it's been broken. Now, it may be that the consumer uh, federal agency may be able to outlaw these arbitration provisions and uh, get rid of that threat, but I, I, I don't think that they will, to tell you the truth. I, you know, there's an irony. It's just a terrible irony, Lynn. Think about it. The idea of class actions is so appealing and so just, the notion that a single individual can stand up for everybody and fight the big corporation. The problem is, in reality, if you let it work, it's too powerful. It's too powerful. A big class action lawsuit in the hands of a lawyer like me, or Jeffrey, or Howard, is a very powerful, threatening economic vehicle I mean, we were on our way, God knows, to recovering how many billions of dollars more in Enron. And believe me, we were shut down by an SOS sent up through the court system saying, help. You know, we used to joke that they wrote a brief one time in the Court of Appeal, which could be boiled down to two sentences. Help, we are trapped with a lunatic in the district court who is going to ruin us. Please help. <laughs> and they did. As people have pointed out, that was a rather depressing presentation. Um, but you also make it sound like it's hopeless. Is it? Or do you have you given up hope that anybody's no. going to be able to turn this around? No, no, and no. and what will it take to turn it around? Uh, it'll take years and time and effort. And there's no easy answer. There's no easy answer. Uh, it may get worse. It may get worse before it gets better. I'm surprised no one asked me a question. Can I ask myself a question? <laughs> Here's a contradictory fact for you, me, to, to deal with. How do you deal with the gay rights decision? With all this criticism of the Supreme Court and how horrible they are and everything, how do we square that up? Well, the fact of the matter is there's one, one justice with a very persistent and particular interest in this issue, Justice Kennedy. Uh, who has made this happen. It's, one, it's really one man. It's a one to zero decision. It's not five four, it's one zero. And uh, he deserves a tremendous amount of credit for that. But that has to be balanced with the fact that his son has been a managing director and a partner in a number of big Wall Street banks over the last 25 years, rotating from one to the other making millions of dollars a year while his dad not only decides and votes, but writes consistently pro-Wall Street opinions. Under the judicial ethics rules applicable to all judges except Supreme Court judges, that's a mandatory recusal, even though it's an adult child living outside of the home, because the decision could have an economic impact on him. And you see the size of these fines. That's real economic impact. I just say, you know, both sides to that issue. Thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago uh, young law students uh, getting angry about issues. And I happen to be a young law student angry about an issue. So yeah, right on. Um, what angers me and what I think is an issue that seems to be uh, occurring more and more on a daily basis is the rise in these uh, sh mass shootings, uh, specifically on school campuses. Um, 
I'm wondering what your thoughts would be on perhaps an approach of going after the gun companies directly as opposed to taking on these individual shooters after the fact. Uh, and if such a lawsuit were to commence, what do you think the success would be? It's an interesting point. You know how we got rid of lead paint in the United States? You don't think the Consumer Product Safety Commission did that for you, don't you? That was private lawyers that exposed. I mean, that's a terrible product. I'm thinking about guns. Unfortunately, the gun guys beat us to it. They went to Congress and got them to pass immunity. So it's very difficult to sue the gun people. Please don't ask me for the solution to the gun problem. I don't know what it is. Thank you. We might amend the yeah. Second Amendment, but that you probably get arrested if you even suggest that. I'm kind of in a unique position because um, although I'm a professor of law at the University of San Diego now, I, I had the luxury of practicing yeah. with Bill. And um, I'm sorry to see your critic leave because I wanted to tell a quick story, Bill, uh, because I know firsthand the good you've done for individuals. And I want everybody to kind of imagine for a moment we're at a settlement meeting, and I was a younger lawyer, younger than Bill, and I showed up at this settlement meeting and all the defense lawyers were there, and there was Bill sitting in the corner of the room with a Wall Street Journal in front of his face. And one of the defense lawyers looked over at him and the paper came down a little bit, and he said, when your fraudulent clients make all of my clients whole, then you can talk to me. You've been a great advocate for the individual. Thank you, Bill. So I'm going to intervene and say we have three people, and let's have those three questions and then call it a night. I just want to make one follow-up comment, as, um, and I'm sorry the gentleman left, too. But oh, he's there. He's sitting right there. Ah, you're there. When Bill Iraq won the Enron case, Cheney knew that Halliburton was next. And he turned around and he said, I want that man put in jail. And that's why Bill Iraq went to jail. Bill, quick question. Uh, for the benefit of the gentleman who had an issue before, uh, what percentage of your cases dealt with insider trading? And your cases were expensive to bring. Also, how many lawyers did you work worked on these things? I mean, everyone looks at the, you know, the result, but they don't see all the work that went into it. So that's my question. Yeah. So it would, if we turn this into a law course or maybe another lecture someday. You know, the, the, the economics of the plaintiff's practice in this kind of area is really a, a pretty unusual business model. It's actually more like an investment bank, if you think about it. Think of a case as a deal, and the deal either works out and you get paid or it doesn't. But along the way, for three or four years, you have to pay your lawyers to work on that case. You have to fund the case, travel all over the world. Uh, I don't know where Bob Fairbank is. I can't see him, but I know he's here anyway. Um, in Enron, I'm trying to remember, but I believe that we were, we had invested about 14 or 15 million dollars in cash in that case before we got a dollar of recovery and God knows how much attorney's fees. So look, it's a high, it was a high, very high risk, high reward practice, very exciting, very exhilarating, very satisfying, but uh, well, you got out of bed every morning and went to work to, to try to settle a case. I'll tell you that. Um, so this is sort of more of an observation, I guess, than a question. But um, I just noticed a few kind of contradictions in um, the idea that the only way to uh, handle these problems is to work within the system. And yet you've stated multiple times that, I mean, you know, Congress is in the pocket of uh, lobbyists. And the system, I think, is fundamentally. I. I see the value in holding individuals accountable, but I think that it's sort of comes as no, abuse of power comes as no surprise historically. And I think that um, just how, how would you address that contradiction of saying, well, the system is fundamentally geared to work right. in this way and built in this way, and yet the only way to confront these issues is to work within the system. Thank you. I, I guess because I don't want to completely marginalize myself by calling for an, an outright revolution. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I meant it when I said I was sorry that there weren't uh, more black faces here. I mean that. Uh, when the civil rights revolution occurred in our lifetime, Stephen, we were in school. 
there weren't tons of young African Americans in college with cell phones educated. You know, these people come up in a post-racial world. And I think they thought things were going to be different. And they got here. And you know what? Things aren't all that different. And now they see their brothers and sisters getting gunned down. I'm not kidding about there being a revolution. There's going to be trouble about this if, if it's not handled correctly. And uh, it's a failure of the legal system. It simply is a failure of the legal system. Thank you and good night. <laughs> Oh.